I'm Dan Levy. I lead uh, equity research coverage of the U.S. auto sector at Credit Suisse, and very pleased to have uh, join join us Hylion. Um, Thomas Healy, CEO and founder of Hylion, as well as Bob Gujavardi, who's the head of investor relations. Um, for those of you who, who may not be aware, Hylion is uh, one of the uh, EV startups that have uh, hit the market this year. Hylion um, approaching this from the uh, the commercial angle. They provide electrified power sl- powertrain solutions, really focused on class eight, I believe. Uh, and rather than going the, the pure EV route or the, the hydrogen route, they're taking the hybrid route. So I think it'll be helpful to hear from them on uh, what they're doing to push electrification or to push decarbonization of the, uh, the heavy vehicle fleet. Um, Thomas is going to walk through uh, a series of slides just to give us an overview, and then we'll go through uh, some questions that I've prepared. Anyone who has a question uh, that they'd like asked, uh, please email me. I'll ask it anonymously, dan.levy, D-A-N dot L-E-V-Y at credit-suisse.com, and uh, I'll I'll try to ask on your behalf. But otherwise, uh, Thomas, Bob, thank you so much for joining. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having us be a part of this. And uh, as you mentioned, I'll go ahead and do a a share screen here. So hopefully you guys are able to see some slides up on the, the presentation now. But uh, so to do introductions, my name is Thomas Healy. I'm the founder and CEO of Hylion. As Dan mentioned, uh, we're, we're a company focused on the electrification of the class eight commercial vehicle space. And, um, you know, we think we're taking a pretty unique approach to this market. And, you know, we're faced today with this amazing opportunity ahead of us where the commercial vehicle space, they know electrification is coming, but they're trying to figure out what an electrified solution is going to be right for them. And as you can see up on the slide uh, that's being presented, there's a lot of different uh, technologies that are being brought forward to address this, this market. Uh, the commercial vehicle space is huge, but what we're seeing is there's a lot of technologies being brought forward in the local delivery, short haul applications, and we're primarily seeing those go fully electric. But as we look at this long haul space, you really have three types of options. You do have fully electric trucks, you've got hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, as well as you have uh, our hybrid product, as well as our hyper truck ERX, which is a full electric drive vehicle that uses an onboard generator to produce electricity and charge the batteries as you go. And that runs off of natural gas or more specifically renewable natural gas. And so, you know, we see that we're positioned in this really unique opportunity where, you know, the long haul space has a lot of quirks to it, right? These trucks are trying to drive 500 miles a day. Uh, They're extremely sensitive to the weight of the vehicle and, you know, they don't have downtime. They don't have time to sit and recharge. And so that's where, you know, you can't just take what necessarily works in the passenger car space or in local delivery and make it work in long haul. And so we'll dive into some more of those pros and cons as we go through the slides ahead, but you know, our focus as an organization is really to be a powertrain company. So we're not reinventing the whole truck. Uh, we're actually using chassis that fleets already know and love, made by companies like uh, Packard or Daimler, Volvo, International. And we're reinventing the powertrain of the vehicle, which is where the evolution really needs to happen. As we look at moving towards electrified solutions, you don't need a whole new truck in order to do that. You really just need a new powertrain. And one of the very exciting things that we see ahead of us is just a tremendous market opportunity. Uh, We're going after about an $800 billion market size. And, you know, we see our solutions as being the the most applicable, widely adopted solution for the long haul space. Uh, We do see that BEV vehicles and fuel cell vehicles have strong opportunities, uh, but we see that they're more in niche markets, at least today, uh, versus our solutions we see being able to be more widely adopted Uh, where we stand in the market at this point. So to dive into a little on those solutions. So our hybrid electric product is one that we're already shipping to fleets today. Uh, We're in low volume rollout of that. We've got some of the very large fleets here in North America, like Penske and Ryder and Ideal Lease. Uh, Wegmans already running that product and seeing some some really great uh, benefits to their fleet as well as we've got our hypertruck solution, which is a fully electric long haul vehicle that uses an onboard natural gas range extender to actually recharge the batteries as you're driving to be able to achieve a long range of a vehicle. But we're kind of bringing forward the best of both worlds. You've got the efficient drivetrain as well as the high horsepower, high torque of an electric vehicle coupled with a very uh, inexpensive and low emissions, extremely low emissions fuel source in natural gas. 
And so over the next couple of slides, those are kind of the focus areas. I want to do a quick comparison of, you know, as we look at this market, I said before, you know, we've got BEV, fuel cell, and, you know, our solution, the hyper truck. And, you know, we want to break down the areas that are most important to fleets. And what we've seen from, you know, feedback from the industry is there's really three parts that they focus on. It's what's the cost of the fuel and the total cost of ownership of the vehicle? What's the infrastructure out there to be able to run this vehicle and be able to recharge it or refuel it? And then what's ultimately the emissions that's going to come from that vehicle? And so on the slide that's being presented right now, uh, you can see a comparison of those three different types of solutions in those three different buckets. And what's really you know, eye-opening to us is as we look at hydrogen and electric vehicles today, the costs are, are very high. You know, hydrogen is more than $10 per diesel gallon equivalent. Um, you know, ver and with electricity, you're often hit with, you know, demand charges, peak charges, which really drives that cost up that, you know, $7 that's being showcased there is, you know, if you went and plugged your Model 3 or your Model S into a supercharger right now, uh, that's what you would get charged. Now, there are projections to be able to pull those hydrogen and electric costs down in the future. Uh, but one of the really eye opening things to us is that natural gas is already a point that's even lower than those future looking projections. And we're there today, right? You can go buy uh, natural gas for a dollar per DGE at a station. And we even have some fleets that are buying it for less than a dollar per DGE out there. So uh, a really low cost uh, fueling solution. And then, you know, coupling that in the middle column here, as we look at infrastructure and you know, this is what we've heard from fleets is usually one of the biggest hurdles when they look at new alternative fuel technologies, because, you know, if you look at hydrogen today, there's not hydrogen stations out there for refueling a class eight truck. Similarly with electric, there's not a, a network of, you know, rechargers across the US. We've got uh, an electric grid, uh, you know, that we can tap into, but uh, now we're running into problems where, you know, if you go to try to adopt, you know, 150 trucks at a terminal, you're going to be faced with, you know, uh, demand charges, peak charges, as well as needing new transformers in the area in order to be able to actually supply that much electricity. Um, you know, down on the bottom of that, that table there is a pretty interesting study done that, you know, looked at if we want to create as many hydrogen and electric refueling stations as there are uh, already natural gas stations across North America. For hydrogen alone, it would be about a $12 billion endeavor. And for electric, it would be about a $7 billion endeavor. So, you know, this is one of the big benefits we have with using RNG, CNG, is that infrastructure is already in place and ready to be utilized. And then the last thing to, to note on this slide is just the emissions that come with the vehicle. So, you know, often we think of uh, hydrogen and electric trucks as being uh, zero emission vehicles. But the reality is, is when you start looking at well to wheel emissions, so, you know, kind of looking at the full life cycle, there's actually a lot of pollutants that can come from these solutions. You know, with hydrogen, most of the hydrogen used today is coming from steam methane reforming, which in many instances is actually a, a solution that's more pollutive than just even running a diesel truck. Uh, there are efforts towards moving towards green hydrogen, but you know the amount of hydrogen that comes from renewable sources today is in the low single digit percentages. And then as we look at electric uh, BEV vehicles, you know the average grid, you, you're sourcing from uh, coal, you're sourcing from nuclear, natural gas, some of it is coming from wind and solar, but you know the average mix of it uh, is not. And so you know there are, are opportunities to get to a zero emissions vehicle, but you can only really source it from wind, solar, and hydro in order to achieve that. And then you know the last column is, is what we're working on, which is renewable natural gas. And you know renewable natural gas is another mega trend uh, that's going on, which is capturing methane coming off of landfills and dairy farms, and being able to pump that fuel or that um, that gas into the natural gas pipelines and use it to drive vehicles like ours. So there's a mega trend going on with renewable natural gas today. Uh, and it's ever increasing the number of stations that are capturing facilities that are out there and then being able to utilize that as a fuel in our, our trucks. And so um, with RNG, you actually have this unique opportunity to, to actually become net carbon negative or below zero emissions profile, depending on where that RNG was sourced and where it came from. Uh, and that's one of the unique advantages uh, that we bring forward with our technology is a truck that can run on uh, a very clean fuel source and, you know, and potentially one that offers a net negative emission profile. 
And then the last slide I just wanted to cover here is a, a total cost of ownership analysis, which, um, you know, while we're still on this slide, uh, just take a look at the column on the left here of the fuel com fuel prices, right? So you see the columns of where we are today versus the future looking projections for hydrogen electric. The table I'm about to show uh, actually uses those future looking projections in order to derive total cost of ownership. So it's not where we are today, it's where we're hoping to get to. And you know what you'll see is that even with those future looking projections of where we hope to get to with hydrogen and electric, uh, we're still in, mo in instances, you know, like the seven year total cost of ownership shown here on the slide, we're still actually more expensive than just even running a diesel truck uh, versus with the natural gas hyper truck solution. We have a unique opportunity to significantly reduce total cost of ownership uh, and do it in a way where, you know, we're not adding on a significant amount of infrastructure cost as well. Uh, that's something that this table doesn't doesn't even account for is, you know, how much does it cost to set up stations to uh, set up, you know, for hydrogen? How do you transport it? How do you get it to the refueling site? Uh, you know, that that is uh, that infrastructure setup is not incorporated in this co cost of ownership study here. So, you know, we really see the, the hyper truck solution leveraging natural gas to charge an electric truck as really a, a solution here that that is a, a great way to get us into electrification with a low low emissions, low cost solution uh, that is going to be a great fit for, you know, being able to travel long distances, uh, long miles on these trucks. So, so with that, that's a little overview on, on us, but, uh, you know, I'd love to, I'll do a stopping of the, the screen share here and, you know, happy to dive into to Q and A. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so why don't, why don't we start the question we've been asking um, many of the other uh, new entrants here. Uh, the, the secret sauce question, right? Um, there's there's other solutions out there, and I think part of it is you have a different powertrain, uh, you know, approach than than uh, than some of your competitors. Um, but what's what's the secret sauce? What's the edge of the product? What enables? And it sounds like really it's hyper truck. That's that's the unique product that you have. What's the edge? Yeah. So I think. With Hypertruck, it, it goes back to um, something I mentioned in that overview, which is just coupling the best of electrification uh, with the best of renewable natural gas as well, right? And, um, you know, as I said, fleets know that electrification is coming, but they're trying to really work on figuring out what's right for them. And, uh, you know, as we look at the other electrified solutions out there, there are hurdles and barriers that need to be overcome. Like, fuel cell technology, the generation of, of hydrogen uh, and clean hydrogen, those are still big barriers that need to be overcome. What we're doing is we're taking technologies that have already been proven. You know, there's already natural gas refueling um, out there and we're, we're coupling it together to offer a realistic solution for, for, fleet, for fleets that is available in the near term. You know, we're not saying, you know, this is a, a decade or two out, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're gonna start delivering uh, demonstration vehicles to fleets next year uh, in 2021. So we're, we're on the cusp of being able to deliver this and the, the infrastructure that's needed in order to make it applicable for fleets and make it work for them is already in place. Great. And then uh, maybe you could just remind us, uh, you know, the difference between a hybrid and the, and the hyper truck, um, you know, what's the customer interest been between those two trucks? Is is the hybrid really just uh, an interim solution right now, just to give you some business to get in the door? Uh, but really, it's all about a uh, hyper truck. So our long term path is definitely both solutions, and you know, just to break it down a little bit, I mean, the, the hybrid solution is an add on that can go on an existing truck, whether it be a diesel truck or a conventional natural gas truck. And it's, it's added on to either add more horsepower to the vehicle or to be able to improve the fuel economy of that vehicle. Now, it's a great step into electrification for fleets. Um, and it's a very low risk step in a lot of ways because at the end of the day, your primary drive of the vehicle is still that diesel powertrain or still that CNG uh, conventional powertrain. But you're starting to, to dabble into electrification and get to experience it. And it's bringing forward strong benefits to the fleet but it's not requiring them to change out their infrastructure. They still go to their same refueling station. Uh, you know, it's, they're still running the truck uh, how they were before. It's just adding some benefits to it. 
now with that, you know, the hyper truck, you are changing, you know, if, for, if you're moving from diesel, conventionally being on diesel to the hyper truck, you're moving to a natural gas, you're needing, you're utilizing new infrastructure. It is a lar larger change, but at the same point, it's bringing forward much stronger and larger benefits as well. So as we look at the years ahead, we really see both products as being a, a core product line for us, but we see the hyper truck having a larger market opportunity uh, and driving more of our revenue in the, in the future here. And the, the relative consumer interest or your customer interest on, on both sides? So we've been fortunate where, uh, you know, especially in the last couple of months here with the announcement of uh, the SPAC transaction and, and taking highly on public and trading on the New York Stock Exchange, the, the reception from fleets has been fantastic. And, you know, I already mentioned some of the fleets that we're running the, the hybrid system with. What we're seeing on the hyper truck side, though, is there are some fleets out there who really want to make that that big leap forward in emission reductions and cost savings, and and they see the hyper truck as really the path to being able to do that. So, you know, I think the the interest from fleets is is strong in both categories, but we are seeing just this this tailwind towards fleets wanting to make a a larger shift forward into electrification, and that's the the hyper truck product. And maybe you can walk us through on, on each of the products. Um, what are you doing in-house? What are you sourcing from, from others? Um, and then, you know, specifically, you know, when you get to the powertrain itself, how are you approaching the cells, the, the drive units, uh, the BMS, um, and then the broader software? So the, you know, what's <clears throat> vertically integrated versus what's outsourced? Absolutely. So, you know, we're trying to approach this on in a way where stay focused on where we're really strong as an organization and then leverage partnerships with others where they have better resources. So uh, our core focus is we're doing the battery module integration, the battery pack, as well as all the software integration to, to bring the whole system together. But things like the electric motor, the axles, we're sourcing those. And we actually have a, a great partnership with Dana um, and where we're able to, to source those components from. And, uh, and the other area to look at is on, you know, the install of the truck, the actual assembly of our product, um, as well as uh, ultimately the service of the system as well. And, you know, we see that as areas where, uh, for instance, use an assembly, you know, Dana has assembly plants all across uh, the globe. And, you know, that's an area where we can leverage uh, their expertise in that category, have them do the assembly of our product for us, and ultimately get this to, pro to market a lot faster than if we were setting up our own, you know, uh, multi hundreds of millions of dollar factory in order to uh, to produce this ourselves. And I think that that thought process goes in line as well with the fact that we're working with the existing chassis that are already in existence, as opposed to trying to develop the truck uh, from the ground up ourselves. I think this is a a point that's that's often missed uh, sometimes in the industry, which is. You know, going and uh, and redeveloping the entire truck from the ground up—that's a huge endeavor, right? Now you're worried about things like airbags and seatbelts and blinkers, and I mean, there's a lot of complexity to these vehicles. But as we step back and we and we look at it and we say, you know, there's this shift to towards electrification that's trying to happen. You don't need a brand new chassis in order to make that shift. You just need a brand new powertrain. And, and that's where Hylion is really focused and being able to, to being enabling technology to take existing chassis and bring them into this new era of electrified powertrains. And why wouldn't you, uh, you know, uh, look, we know, for instance, Cummins is an engine supplier, you know, uh, uh, you know, there are plenty of customers that want to buy Navistar or Packard trucks. Why wouldn't you just supply just like, Chem uh, you know, Cummins is, is, a, is an engine supplier. Why wouldn't you just supply a, an updated powertrain to Packard or Navistar rather than doing that yourself, the, the entire truck? So that is the plan is, you know, our goal is eventually the technology can be installed right on the OEM truck assembly lines, where we are a powertrain provider to the Packards or the, uh, you know, the internationals, the Volvo, the Daimlers of the world, uh, very similar to what Cummins does today, as you mentioned, right, you can go buy any truck in North America, uh, I believe any truck, uh, you know, with a Cummins engine or with, you know, others engines as well. And so that is where we're positioning ourselves, where we're another powertrain provider, but leveraging those existing chassis from the existing OEMs. Great. So that, that's, that, that's the ultimate path. Uh, but in parallel to if someone wants to buy 
uh, you know, a hyper truck, they can, or they can buy a, you know, truck from pack car with your powertrain. That that's so. In order to get it installed on the factory line, I mean, that is a path where we're ultimately planning to head down and, and get pulled in. Where we are today is we've set up with uh, partnerships with companies like Fontaine and Lone Star, who are uh, companies that have what are called mod centers, and they're actually you know facilities that uh, can take chassis right from the OEMs and then do upfits of them. Like for instance, Fontaine has facilities located right next to uh, the truck manufacturing plants. So a truck chassis can come down the line, go then get shipped right to Fontaine's uh, location, which is right next to the factory. And then uh, our plan is to be able to have our system upfitted there. Now we've already done that with our hybrid system. And then we see that as the same path we'll use for the hyper truck to get started before we, we could get it pulled in uh, to right on the factory line. Good. Um, let's just wrap up one more on the, on the product side before we go into competition. Uh, you know, you specifically said you're focused on class eight, uh, as opposed to short haul, uh, or, or buses. Um, you know, why the focus purely on, on class eight? Is it that, you know, you, you just won't have the economics to compete, uh, at, at lower, uh, you know, at lower vehicle sizes. Yeah. So it, there's a few different things that kind of go into it. Um, one is, you know, we see it as one of the more difficult areas to, to bring electrification forward. And, uh, and subsequently, that's met, that means that for the long haul class eight stand, market, there's less solutions available. I mean, we really see it as there's kind of only two other companies that are focused on long haul class eight electrification, which is uh, Tesla and Nikola. Your existing truck OEMs have more focused their time and effort right now on local delivery, uh, short haul BEV vehicles. So, so that is one. You know, is uh, it's a it's an area that's a little bit more difficult to electrify, but you have to be creative with kind of what we're doing with is which is coupling natural gas with electrification in order to make it work. Um, the uh, so that that's one of the the reasons that we we stay focused on the class eight. Now the other is. You know, as we as we step back and look at market opportunities, we see that there's there's actually great opportunities for our solutions in class six, class four type of vehicles. But if we came to market and we were trying to address all those right at right out of the gate, we would spread ourselves too thin. And so we looked at it and said, look, there's 300,000 trucks every year made in the North America just for the class eight market and about a million trucks globally made every year for class eight that's a plenty sizable market for us to get started in and to have many years of success in before we would need to even look at moving to a different class of vehicle. So that's why we st we're starting here and you know we're focused on that right now, but that's not to say that down the road, our technology wouldn't be applicable to other classes. Good. Um, okay, let's, let's pivot, uh, I guess, to the competition side or at least a blend of this. You know, we were talking about your sourcing strategy. Cummins is the, the CNG provider or the RNG provider for you, yes? Uh, so we have not announced who we're, whose generator we're using at this stage. Uh, you, you haven't, okay. Um, all right, well then let me, I, I guess, let me, let me ask more, more, more broadly, yeah. um, who, uh, you know, uh, how, do I, how do you compete with a player like Cummins that has its own efforts in, uh, you know, in, in, in EV or hydrogen, um, but is obviously much, much larger, much, you know, uh, much more established. How do you compete against a, a player like that? Yeah, so I think it, it comes down to where are the competitors focusing their time and effort, right? So as, you know, as we've spoken with Cummins, uh, you know, they've got uh, efforts in, internally going on towards hydrogen fuel cells. Same thing with Companies like Daimler or Volvo have announced uh, efforts going towards hydrogen fuel cell. And so, you know, that's where what we're saying is, look, our, our sweet spot, our niche to really get started in this industry is in that hyper truck solution, which is, uh, you know, a, a, comp a coupling of the natural gas generator with an electric vehicle. Uh, to my knowledge, I think we're, we're the only ones uh, that are approaching it that way. Um, and, and so, you know, what we, and we've had discussions with these other companies, uh, like the ones you were mentioning, where, you know, we've, we've kind of gotten an understanding of what their roadmap is and how they're addressing it, and then what opportunities we have to go to market that is in a different approach. And, um, you know, for instance, you know, it's, it's not something that, you know, an OEM couldn't go do work on the solution that we are, but, uh, you know, we believe we have a leg up on being the first one going down that path. 
And then, you know, from the OEM standpoint, if they're, if they're focusing their effort on local delivery, short haul BEV vehicles, if we can work with them to then have, allow them to take their chassis and offer that in a long haul uh, space with an electrified Hylion powertrain, that's a win for them as well, because that's a, opening up a product line that they didn't uh, necessarily have in their portfolio right now, because they've been focusing their electrification efforts on uh, a different part of the market. Good. And then uh, one more, you know, there's a, a, obviously you probably heard of, uh, you know, another one of your competitors, XL Fleet. Um, they're taking a somewhat similar approach, although slightly broader powertrain scope. Um, but the difference is they're doing, you know, uh, a, a true upfit strategy rather than, uh, than an, an OE approach. Um, how do you stack up uh, versus a, a, an XL? Why, why is your strategy superior to uh, an upfitting strategy right now? Yeah, so uh, we know XL well, and I mean, they, their approach is, I think, more on the smaller classes of vehicles, kind of more the, the class four type of, uh, of vehicles. And, um, you know, I would, I would equate our hybrid electric product that we have that we're shipping out today, very similar to the kind of upfit of the class four vehicles that they're doing is, you know, you still have that, uh, that gasoline powertrain in, in an XL fleet, and they're adding the hybrid system onto it. That's, that's very similar to what we're doing with our, our hybrid approach. Uh, so I think the differentiator is we're going after different markets. Uh, and, and then with Hylion, we also have the, the hyper truck solution that is in development uh, that kind of puts us in a position where with the hyper truck release, we're now the full powertrain provider of the vehicle versus with hybrid, we're really an add-on or an upfit as, as you were saying to the, the truck with the hyper truck. Now we're in a position that that whole powertrain is really being driven by Hylion. Uh, great. L let's, uh, let's pivot to the, the customer base. Um, and obviously, you know, decarbonization of fleets is, uh, you know, is a clear trend in the market. Um, how much are you seeing this as what we'll call a, a nominal effort by, by fleet owners that it's okay. Here's, a few token vehicles that we're going to decarbonize versus a significant, uh, you know, overhaul of, of fleets. Um, and, and then I guess uh, the second question I'd ask is, uh, look, it's, it, you know, uh, you know it, it's probably easier or it, it makes for a better headline to have a pure hydrogen or pure BEV truck. Um, is the, I guess the value add of your truck that you can more significantly overhaul a, a, an entire fleet uh, with your solution from a cost perspective, rather than doing that with a hydrogen or or BEV approach. So how how significant is the decarbonization effort that you're seeing, and uh, your value add versus the hydrogen or BEV approach in that regard? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, what we've seen is there's there there are kind of two types of customers out there. There are ones that are more focused on the emissions first, which we've seen as a pretty small segment of the market and then the rest of the market, it all comes down to total cost of ownership, right? Fleets fleets are in the business of getting points, getting goods from point A to point B and doing it as cost effective and efficiently as possible. And so if you can bring them forward a solution that saves them money, fleets are gonna adopt it and they're gonna adopt it very fast. If you're bringing forward a solution that just has the emission savings, but it's ultimately gonna cost them money, the only way a fleet's gonna adopt that is if they have an alternative motive of like having a, a carbon emission reduction plan corporate wise or the, the company that they're shipping for has a plan like that, or if it's getting government subsidies and that's ultimately what's then driving the lower cost of ownership. You know, we haven't seen a, a fleet come to us and say, hey, we don't really have an emissions target, uh, but you know, we're willing to adopt something that that's gonna cost me more, right? I mean, that that's not how these fleets operate. So. I think the biggest thing for fleets, and we hear this time and time again, every single customer call we have is it's, we got to get it at a cost of operation that makes sense. That's less than diesel. Even for some of the major brands out there who have a, announced, uh, you know, very strong corporate initiatives towards net carbon zero. Ultimately, even though that's a big driver, they still want to focus on the cost. They got to make sure that this isn't costing them more than a diesel truck. So, you know, I think that's one of the big benefits that we have at Hylion is we truly can bring forward those cost benefits, right? Natural gas is at a low cost today. And, uh, and that's one of our big differentiators and, and ultimately resonates really well with fleets and, and kind of drives their interests because uh, we can get to that cost, uh, cost parity or, or below cost uh, of operation of a diesel truck. 
Now to your second part of the question about, you know, is, is kind of going BEV or going fuel cell uh, more intriguing to a fleet? Yeah, I think it is, right? I mean, there's there's more headlines about moving to hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. And even from Hylion's end, we've positioned ourselves that as the hydrogen market is ready, we can replace the generator in our in our powertrain with a hydrogen fuel cell or hydrogen generator to be able to drive that, that vehicle and the rest of the powertrain stays the same. You just change the tanks that you store the, the fuel in and you change the generator. So that puts Hylion in a position that as that hydrogen market evolves and, and becomes actually ready, you know, as there are stations out there, as there's available hydrogen, we can morph our powertrain into being able to run on hydrogen and then, you know, be able to compete in that space as well. But we saw that as it's, it's a long ways away until we're ready to kind of make that shift to hydrogen. So let's take advantage of a, a powertrain using natural gas that we can realistically do today. And, and as far as, thank you. And then, it, you know, it sounds like TCO is the primary focus of customers. And you have a, a slide in your deck that talks about other metrics uh, that you're competing with your competition on uh, range, payload, uh, you know, refuel time, uh, performance. Uh, what would you say is, I guess, the, the, the secondary most important factor is it, it's just about TCO and the rest is, is, you know, good to have, you know, how do we consider the other areas where you're stacking up against your competition? Yeah. So after the TCO, I mean, there, there's definitely the emissions discussion as well, right. About, well, how does it stack up to a, a fuel cell or BEV vehicle? But, but then it goes into kind of what's, what's the practicality of being able to adopt it. Right. So, you know, we've, we've already dove in with fleets on, hey, there's a, a station that's a mile away from your distribution center that you can refuel on natural gas. So we've checked the box. You've got a place to refuel. Uh, you know, another thing we've heard from fleets is, you know, they've looked at uh, a big part of their business is just how do you service these vehicles? How do you keep them on the road, right? And if you move to a totally new chassis, a totally new cab, uh, are there going to be spare parts available versus with our solution, we're, we're leveraging that existing chassis that you can bring to the local truck dealership and they know how to work on it. Um, so, you know, there's just that practicality of what's it really going to take to adopt. And, you know, I think we're starting to see some of those, those uh, impracticalities come forward with some of the early BEV prototype trucks that are out there. You know, for instance, a fleet we were talking to is running one where uh, they were saying they can really only run 100 to 150 miles a day and on it, and then it has to sit the rest of the day and get recharged before the next day uh, comes versus on a diesel truck, they could run that route three times a day uh, or four times a day, maybe even, um, you know, compared to, you know, now they're only able to run it once. So that doesn't work for a fleet, right? Going back to the point earlier, it's about making it as efficient as possible to, to move goods around. Having a truck sitting and charging for, you know, north of 10 hours a day is impractical. Good. Let's. I know we're over time. Let's try to squeeze in uh, a couple more if sure. we can. Give the rapid um, fire answers. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there we go. There we go. Uh, no, this is just such an interesting topic. So thank you. Um, it, you know, you got a, an order of a thousand uh, hyper trucks from a uh, logistics provider Agility. Maybe you can give us a sense of you know what was the process of receiving that order. You know, and, you know, what can we extrapolate from that in terms of interest discussion? I mean, I guess it just gets to the broader process of, you know, you're a smaller player, you're, you're newer to the game. Um, you know, how difficult has customer acquisition been? Is it literally, you know, you have, you have to just build up the sales force or has it been inbounds? What's the process of customer acquisition? And what can we derive from this agility order? Yeah, so since the announcement of, you know, kind of getting Hylion's name out there a little bit more, we've received a, a tremendous amount of inbound, which has been great to see. And some of it's come from some of the very large players uh, of operating trucks. Um, in terms of agility, it's it was really working with their senior executive team and showing them the value propositions that the the truck can bring forward. They had they had you know kind of run uh, analysis on some of the other solutions like BEV or hydrogen, and they saw the roadblocks and the hurdles there. And so it just it, the the conversation kind of shifts towards this is a practical and realistic solution, and that's what really got Agility excited and 
And for them, they're a company that does a lot of uh, moving of goods for other brands. So they'll take, you know, large B2C companies and move their goods for them. So they looked at it as they can take the emission savings from Hylion, pass that forward, pass that through to their customers as a big win. And then for agility, it, it was a low cost in terms of infrastructure uh, ability to be able to adopt a solution. And it had cost savings that then, you know, obviously is a big win for agility as well. So it was kind of a win for the fleets they ship for or the companies they ship for as well as them as a fleet. And, uh, and then as far as the infrastructure build out, I think you said you have something like 700, there's 730 uh, RNG uh, refueling stations who pays for that. What's the process of building that out? Yeah, so those those stations are already in existence. They're run by companies like uh, American Natural Gas, who we have a partnership with, or Clean Energy, or U.S. Gain, Trillium, or some of the larger players here in North America. So those stations are there. You can you could take your a passenger car that runs on natural gas and go refuel there. And uh, and so those in those stations, one key thing to note is that like 700 number are all designed for heavy duty trucks, right? So those aren't like passenger car ones that, you know, we're, we're claiming those are really ones focused on being able to refuel trucks. And, uh, and so those are already there. And, you know, we're creating partnerships with the fueling providers so that as we have discussions with fleets, we can e easily pass the fleet on to, you know, figuring out who their local fuel provider is and how they can get access to renewable natural gas and, and conventional natural gas. Right, so a separate set of uh, of players in the infrastructure build out. Maybe let's just wrap up with uh, with two last ones. Maybe you could just tell us where your order book is, uh, how you expect that to evolve, any color on you know the the customer base by region. I don't know if you, uh, if you uh, if you're outside of uh, North America, uh, and then I guess the last one is just on milestones. Anything you can tell us on milestones ahead? Yeah. So. Uh, in terms of the rollouts here, so we've been announcing uh, more deployments of the hybrid systems. We'll continue doing that. Uh, in terms of the hyper truck, uh, we're working on pulling together kind of the initial class of fleets that we're going to be doing the, the demo rollout with in the second half of next year. Uh, so we'll, you know, in the future, we'll be announcing that, that list of, uh, of fleets. And, uh, and for us, you know, the focus is really on, um, you know, building those customer relationships uh, getting them excited about the technology, but ultimately identifying who are going to be the fleets that can ultimately help us achieve that, that future uh, growth of the organization, being able to get a, a relationship solidified, solidified with them right now, and then deliver trucks to them uh, starting next year, the second half of next year, and then go into commercialization in, in 22. So those are some of the, the key milestones that, that we've got coming up over the next uh, year or two ahead of us here. And then color on the, the the order book or any any trends there on where that stands or what that comprises. Yeah, so we you know the interest from fleets has been really strong and you know we're working on on setting up those relationships, but we'll we'll announce those uh, publicly. I mean the only ones we've announced thus far are agility and uh, NANG, but um, as you know as we get those to fruition, we will we will announce those. I, I lied. I was in just one more. Uh, do you have a, you know, I guess this gets to, on the financials, you know, the, the cost of developing the tech. Is there a, a, you know, a number of a base volume that you need to reach uh, break even or, you know, what type of uh, what type of share do you need in, in the class eight market to, to, to be break even? Yeah, so we haven't given exact guidance on, on that. And, you know, I wouldn't want to do so at, at this stage, but I think you know, we're in a position right now where we've got good and strong interest from our suppliers where we're able to set up those longer term relationships and we're still setting those up right I mean we're we're uh, we're in that that kind of development phase right now and uh, and then you know we see this as something that we can ultimately grow to some really strong uh, margin levels but ultimately in order to do that it's about volume and getting this really rolled out in the fleet and so um, you know, I think at this stage, we're not willing to give guidance on like how many numbers of trucks exactly we need in order to hit break even. But, uh, you know, we see a strong path ahead of us here to be able to achieve those, those really healthy margin levels. Great. Thank you. I know we're, we're well over time. So Thomas and Bob, thank you. This is, uh, this is a great session. We look forward to learning more about the, uh, about the highly on narrative as it unfolds. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us on, Dan. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Thank you. Open Exchange, you can now close the session.